thank you for joining the conference. Um, today I thought I'd lead off by just commenting. I signed a little over 20 bills this morning, uh, included among them some that I think are noteworthy is the omnibus water bill that spends about $13 million on water projects that will be uh, funded across the state. These would be drinking water, wastewater projects, solid waste projects, all related to water and the environment. And these are uh, funds that are set aside by the fee collected on petroleum tank inspections and uh, lotto. And uh, every year we sign a multi-million dollar bill like this that helps fund the maintenance of primarily municipal projects. I also signed a bill uh, this morning related to uh, drug use. Uh, we have, of course, controlled substances laws, and every year the uh, inventive chemists among us find means to modify a prohibited substance in some way and then can make the claim that this is a different substance, it's not prohibited, and so we can freely sell and distribute it. And so, for example, fentanyl is a growing problem in South Dakota. Um, meth users will sometimes turn to fentanyl or you'll have mixture of fentanyl with other drugs. And then there's some fentanyl lookalikes that this bill will prohibit. And I think it tries to categorically prohibit fentanyl lookalikes. So I signed that this morning. And then finally, and you should have press releases about that in your inbox. Uh, then finally, uh, something uh, that I signed this morning was a bill that furthered, that amended some legislation that passed last year that allowed the Board of Regents to take some action with the School for the Deaf property in Sioux Falls, which is in, in some areas uh, improved but not fully occupied, and in other areas, unimproved land that is idle and for which there's no foreseeable use. And at my encouragement, the legislature passed a bill last year to authorize the Board of Regents to sell this property, and they came back and asked, could we have a little bit more flexibility to sell or lease some of the improved property? And then also we learned between last year and this year that some of the property is original trust property that's constitutionally protected in terms of where the money goes. Some of the property is not original trust property, and so there's a little more flexibility about how those dollars may be spent. In both cases, they will ultimately benefit the school for the deaf. It's just whether they must go into a trust fund or whether they could be spent on capital improvements for the school for the deaf or in some other way benefit the school for the deaf. So that bill was signed this morning and, and that gives the Board of Regents the ability to move forward and have more flexibility to lease or sublease the improved property and to sell or otherwise deal with the unimproved property. One other topic that I thought might be of interest if you uh, didn't see it, uh, earlier this week we released revenue uh, receipts for uh, the taxes we collected at the very end of January. In most cases, in many cases, I should see, these are taxes that were uh, collected by Department of Revenue directly in, in uh, January. In some cases, they reflect, uh, for example, in sales taxes, they reflect taxes collected by retailers in December and then then sent to revenue in January. So they're a little, they're a month older than some of the other taxes, if, if you will. And that's always been the case. So uh, the news on that front is positive. The, the revenue received was a little better than we had hoped. And this is the second month in a row when the, where we see revenue is a little bit better than the situation I was faced when I presented the budget in December. So in other words, sequentially, I presented the budget. Now we've since had two more months of better revenue. And so this gives us a, uh, a picture that is a little brighter. It may be that we'll get closer to our FY18 target that we'd originally identified when the legislature adjourned last year. 
Uh, time will tell. The, um, the thing to watch, uh, if you're in the media, is Monday, the Joint uh, Appropriations Committee will be hearing now the projection forward, given these additional months of history, the Bureau of Finance and Management will adopt a new revenue projection and the Legislative Research Council economists will also adopt a new revenue projection. And both of those projections will be presented to the Joint, Com uh, Joint Appropriations Committee on Monday. And then I believe they intend to formally choose a number whether it's one or the other or something in between or, or whatever it may be, choose a number uh, in a formal way Tuesday. And of course, that will then govern how much expenditures uh, we must live within. So that's coming up, and uh, it's positive news to some degree. And um, so we'll, we'll hope for a, a good revenue projection. Uh, the admonition I will always be giving to the legislature is let's be careful and not, not be too rosy in our projection. Uh, we want to, uh, we can always spend the money if, after it arrives. If we project something that doesn't show up, then we end up having to cut the budget and, and that's um, a bait and switch from the vantage point of someone who's expecting payments and then is surprised when they are suddenly cut. We haven't seen it to a great degree in this state, but many states see that pretty regularly. And so I think we want to continue a pattern where we project revenue conservatively and live within that conservative estimate. And if good news arrives and more money is there, then there's still time to spend it at that point. With that, I'll open up for questions. Have you, have you spoken with uh, Mr. Terwilliger about uh, what kind of projection he might be bringing to appropriation? Uh, the question was, have I spoken to Jim Terwilliger, our Bureau of Finance and Management uh, economist, about what his projection will be? And the answer is no, I haven't. I know he's working on the calculations. As I say, we just got that the most recent month this year or excuse me, uh, this week. The other thing to recall is that when we put together the projection in December, the Council of Economic Advisors, as well as our uh, national level um, economy firm, Market, M-A-R-K-I-T, both were uh, making their projections of leading indicators based upon an assumption that no tax bill would pass. Of course, subsequently, a tax bill did pass. And so uh, Jim is also consulting with our economists about how that has changed their outlook for the national economy, which, of course, impacts the South Dakota economy as well. And that will be a factor as well as, well as this historical uh, receipts situation. Uh, just building off that question, um, <clears throat> can you say, are, are you more optimistic that uh, state employees, education, Medicaid providers might get an increase this year based on these numbers? There's certainly hope for that. Now where I would say in December, there was little hope for that. But uh, it, time will tell. We'll see. We'll see what the economists... I must say, uh, the Bureau of Finance and Management has a very good algorithm. They're, they don't always hit the mark with their projection, but they're always very close unless there's some very significant recession that comes upon us. Otherwise, they're, they're pretty close within half a percent or one percent. That's pretty good when you're dealing with a $1.6 billion budget. Still, that one percent, if it's 1.6 million, that could be $16 million, right? So that's, that's a big number. So you don't want to be off, and if you're going to be off, you need to be off by conservative estimates of revenue that revenue actually exceeds rather than off on the other side. And just looking at the year to date, it looks like it's 18.2 million above your December budget projection. I mean, can you characterize um, in your mind how, how significant you think that variance is? It seems like a lot of money. Uh, it's certainly good. We've also had some months uh, leading up to the projection where we were down quite a bit 
you know, we've had months. I'll, I'll just give you an example. Last year, if, if you hearken back to last year, we had uh, pretty good revenue up until the last revenue month before, I think it was last month before we adjourned, where revenue was down 10 million as compared to what our projection was. So in one month, you could have a pretty wide swing. And then, um, then we had three months of relatively good revenue. And then we had a string of bad months of bad revenue. So it just, it can be all over the board. There's also Senate Bill 177, which would, I think, um, tie state employees' wage increases to maybe the CPI. Um, have you looked at that bill, and is that something you would support? I think we have to always live within our revenue. I think uh, it's it would be nice to say we should automatically make payments based on inflation, but if our revenue doesn't meet inflationary targets, then that law is just a statement of attitude in we just can't execute a law like that so um, I think we've in in uh, the years I've been in office of course the first year we had to make significant cuts and we were not able to give salary increases to state employees in several years after that we gave increases that were in excess of inflation to try and catch up and then last year and again this year at least to date um, the I should say last year in the current year fiscal year 18 um, the budget does not allow for salary increases and my December FY19 budget did not propose any salary increases now as I just responded to your question I'm hopeful that we can do better than zero for FY19 if the revenue projections allow it Changing the topic a bit, uh, two Senate committees took up your bill, uh, Senate Bill 169, as well as another proposal, Senate Bill 173, which doesn't allow for the same amount of self-distribution by craft brewers. Um, is that something you're willing to budge on? Will you compromise on self-distribution? Well, at this stage, I still think our bill is uh, very defensible and is the right policy. Again, um, the uh, alcohol controls that are a creature of state law has treated the alcohol industry differently than any other industry where we establish how the alcohol is manufactured and distributed and retailed. And um, we don't do that with other industries. If it's uh, if you're manufacturing farm equipment, we don't say you must deal through a distributor. If you're producing donuts, uh, we don't say you have to deal through a distributor. I can't think of any other uh, law in South Dakota where we say if you're a manufacturer of some kind of product, you can only deal through a distributor. And so. It was that way in the beginning, I think, after Prohibition, when uh, there, there really was quite a bit of uh, public sentiment that was divided and very passionate about whether alcohol should be permitted or not permitted. And when Prohibition ended, those who gained permission in law, I think, may have gained that permission only because that permission was very highly regulated, and the way alcohol made its way into consumers' hands was very highly controlled. Now, is there justification for doing that as some sort of a public safety, or uh, I could see the argument that it makes it easier to tax it because it's much more centralized, but I believe our Department of Revenue is satisfied they can continue to control that and collect taxes fairly. And so, uh, again, I think conceptually, the regulation makes no sense to me. The tightly regulated process of dealing only through distributors, it should be up to 
the free market to decide whether distrib distributor use makes sense, as it does in many products, or whether direct retailing should be allowed, as it is in many products. <clears throat> Can you give us any um, sense of how negotiations are going, or what have you been doing to try and pass your bill versus Senator Kurd's bill? What's going to happen there? Well, uh, I think both bills have passed out of committee, and they're on the floor, and ultimately the Senate will have to take them up. And I think there's been a delay to see, to make sure all parties who are involved in the discussion have an opportunity to hear from both sides. And so I'm sure the senators are, are hearing from both sides, probably ad nauseum. And this, uh, but ultimately they're gonna have to make a judgment. Do, uh, is the one bill a better policy than the other? They'll have to make that judgment. On that same issue, there are two sitting legislators who have a pretty active stake in that discussion. Both are distributors. Do you think they should be able to vote on that policy change? Uh, I do. I think uh, we have legislators from every walk of life, and to the extent that uh, legislat legislators have a... Uh, a stake in some topic, they might also have unique and valuable information on that topic as well. So if uh, there's a bill about governors and the governor is in the legislature, then they can, that governor can speak about the, the, the nature of being a governor and everyone will know, well, that guy's a governor, so we have to take what he says with a grain of salt. So it doesn't matter what occupation you are, Anytime a piece of legislation comes up that bears upon your occupation, I think the, more, the important thing is everyone knows uh, in this case that the legislators who have a stake have that stake. And they also appreciate the additional information and insights they can bring. And in this case, I, I don't have any doubt that these two individuals are honest people. In my opinion, they're honest people. The Senate Ag Committee <clears throat> debated uh, Senate Bill 199 last night, uh, fairly late, and um, just wanted to get uh, your sense on the legislation and, and, and maybe some discussion on the open waters, more discussion on the open waters compromise. Yes. Uh, in this situation, uh, instead of having, as in the alcohol bills, both bills in the same House, we've got uh, one bill in the Senate and one bill in the House. Or I, sh I should say one bill has already made it through the House, gone through the whole process, and the other bill is still making its way through the Senate. And again, I, I uh, am... Uh, I have uh, a great deal of respect for the sponsors of the Senate bill. Uh, as individuals, and uh, our administration is especially interested in certainty. We have certainty today, and if the legislature finds some other uh, means of balancing the interests of landowners and the interests of sportsmen in a way that is agreeable to a majority of the two bodies, then it probably is worthy of signature. Now, whether they can find that in this uh, proposed alternative to the current law, I don't know. It, uh, from the, uh, the attitude of the committee, when they sent it down without recommendation, it seems that the committee doesn't think so, doesn't think it's there, but they wanted to give the whole body a chance to debate this issue and have it open to the full floor and have uh, public debate in that uh, forum. So I respect that, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to handle it, and, and we'll see how that debate plays out. The Senate's already made their judgment, at least on the bill I had proposed, and that's status quo, uh, although they, I saw they repealed the um, sunset date entirely. So right now, 
it wouldn't have a sunset date three years from now, as I had proposed, and I think was originally part of the summer study bill. Uh, it just simply has no sunset whatsoever. Do you agree with repealing that sunset and just making it permanent? Well, I think either one is fine. In any case, I think the original idea was to give a several year period uh, before the legislature would be forced to look at it again. Um, after, after several years, I think we would have a good sense of whether there's some problems. Uh, still, though, if you think about it, if we have a sense that there's some problems, we'd probably act anyway to address those problems. Someone who is concerned about it would raise it in the legislature anyway, whether the sunset date had arrived or whether it's a year ahead of that. So I think either way, it can work all right. Turn to the phones if there's any questions on the phones. Remember to uh, do the pound sign and six to unmute yourself. All right, back to the room. We're about halfway through session right now, closing in on that. Could you give us an overview of how you look at the past several weeks and what we're looking at in the weeks to come other than long days and nights? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, as you know, we have a pretty heavy bill load this year. I think this is the heaviest bill load I've had as governor in, this, in my eighth session now. Um, some of that is impacted by mirror bills, which is uh, a creature, I would say, of uh, the last decade, and some of it is a creature of placeholder bills where, or title bills where something not much more than a title is introduced. And again, that's something 20 years ago that was not done. Uh, so that, that impacts the bill load, and to the extent that the same exact issue is raised by identical bills in the two houses, I think the debate certainly is not twice as long as it would be if you had two completely different issues. Uh, that being said, I do uh, give credit to the legislature. Uh, I know in some weeks they have completed their entire calendar before leaving for the week. And in prior years, sometimes you never saw that. Now today, I know they're not planning to do that because of the weather, but I would, I would have I would not have been surprised if they stayed to complete their entire debate calendar before going home were it not for the bad weather we're seeing. So I, I give credit for the legislature. And then uh, they're foreseeing this bill load as not foreseeing, reacting to the bill load. They, uh, several committees have immediately turned to additional meetings in the afternoons and evenings. And again, that's a very responsible approach to managing it well before the, uh, we near the end of session. Certainly they're attentive to crossover day, which is coming up as well, but it's, it's they're handling things responsibly. I think that's good legislative leadership. In the next three weeks ahead, what do you forecast, what do you see as well, I think things will be uh, very busy again next week as people are confronted with the impending crossover day. And um, then I think uh, the last week, and they'll also be dealing with revenue. And to the extent there's uh, a better projection of revenue, then there will be debates about how to deal with that revenue and who who should benefit. And. Um, but I do think probably the last week of session will be, as it always is, a little bit slower. You know, there might be some conference committees that deal with one or two issues that are still in dispute. Uh, last year we had a lot of conference committees that were very active near the end. But um, I don't know that we'll see that again. We might, but uh, it's this, uh, this week or two preceding crossover day are, is always very busy. And so next, this week, we're seeing that. Next week, I think we'll see it, too. Uh, 
<clears throat> Sorry, I just wanted to ask about the revenue again. Yes. Do you have any priority where if there were to be an increase, I mean, would you be looking to education or state workers specifically or Medicaid? Well, in, in recent years, uh, those three education, Medicaid providers, and state employees have been treated uh, about the same. Uh, in the year here, two years ago, of course, we gave a very substantial increase to education, and I think that you know the legislature is conscious of that. And uh, this year, in spite of the uh, uh, poor revenue forecast, we still hope to free up some dollars in Medicaid through uh, use of this policy about. Indian Health Service users, and then the do the dollars that are freed up from those savings, I proposed that we turn around and spend on Medicaid services and provider rates. So uh, my hope is that the legislature will give attention to state employees. We know that. We know from uh, a pretty comprehensive salary survey that we are behind the market. And as I mentioned in the budget, budget speech, we have some groups of employees that are considerably behind the market. And uh, so if they want to depart from this uh, pattern where we've given the same percentage to all, I hope they give some nod to state employees because I think Unless we do that, we're, we're going to have more turnover and we'll have difficulty recruiting. And, and uh, so I'm hopeful they'll give some attention to employees. Do you worry at all about the state uh, losing its competitive edge that allows you to keep some of those employees? I do. I think... Uh, uh, I think most of our state employees are very hardworking and dedicated and feel good about public service. I think that's part of their motivation for working for the state versus a private employer. Uh, but at some point, you still need to be able to pay a working wage, a living wage, and... Uh, it's hard to say to a state employee, stay with us even though you're being offered more money to do something very similar, even in your own community. So, you know, whether it be correctional employees that are attracted to jails in nearby town or in the same town or law enforcement officers that are attracted to sheriffs or police departments or other things like that, we, we have to be competitive or people can still give public service and feel that sense of giving back to their community, but working for a different government level. And so we have to be competitive. <clears throat> I was just going to ask, um, and I know Dana asked generally about this last week, but it's uh, Representative Mickelson's bill um, on... Uh, petition circulators, and it would be requiring a lot more information for circulators, their, the prefix of their cell phone number, um, you know, where they went to, how much they're paying in tuition, that kind of thing. Can you say specifically what you think of that bill? Yes, I, I uh, since last week, have seen that bill and read it, and I must say the, the list is quite a laundry list, and I, I wonder, I think the the intent is good. I think we do want circulators who are South Dakota residents to be honestly South Dakota residents. I have heard a circulator say, myself, that they were from Colorado. And yet they thought because they worked for a company that was based in South Dakota, they were told they were okay to circulate. Well, that's not right. That's, that's not what the law says. So we might have to be a little bit more overt through some sort of an affidavit where people understand I personally must be a resident. I can't work for a South Dakota organization. I must personally be a resident. And so whether the um, affidavit has to contain 
the level of detail that uh, this bill does or not, in some way we have to help, in most cases, I'm sure, innocent mistakes, we have to prevent them. And in some cases where people are intentionally violating the law, we have to, through an affidavit or some other means, make them conscious that now you're, you're committing a crime and, and you're doing so in writing and you might be held to, to account. So I'm not sure, I think the middle, a middle ground would be found or, or can be found. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Hey, safe travels if you're on the road. Oh, I'm sorry, there is a question. <laughs> Governor, real quick, I've, I've got two, and that was uh, based on what some of the uh, legislative leaders were talking about at their press conferences this morning. One would be your thoughts on a, a bill that would make texting and driving a primary offense, and the second, there's another one floating around regarding the lengths of the terms that lawmakers would serve. Should lawmakers spend more time out here legislating before having to worry about running for re-election. Oh, I see. Uh, well, on the former, if that uh, texting bill reaches my desk, I'd sign that. I think uh, texting and driving is extremely dangerous. And um, there's many, many other distractions, of course, that people you could point to and say, well, why do we allow eating and driving? And why do we allow listening to the radio or doing other things that many people do uh, I'd say relatively more safely, albeit a distraction, but texting and driving is, is extremely dangerous because you're, you're incented or not incented. Your inclination is to keep reading instead of you know, glancing at the radio dial or glancing at the, the fuel gauge or glancing in the rearview mirror and then back to the road. When you glance at a text, you, you're inclined to keep reading and so that's very dangerous and so I, I could see signing that bill if it gets through the legislature. Uh, as for term limits, um, whether a legislator serves two or four years I think is of less consequence than how long a legislator serves. In my estimation, eight-year term limits is a little too short. I like term limits. I think term limits are good but eight years is a little too short to force people um, to either run for the other house. I, if it were up to me and I was writing a brand new law, I'd say 12 years total and out, period. And I would say it doesn't matter if you switch houses or stay, a total of 12 years and out. That would be my attitude. You'd have enough institutional knowledge. You'd have people that would stay in their house and develop some uh, relationships with their members and those who deserve to be leaders would emerge to be leaders and there wouldn't be this jockeying for leadership as you see with shorter term limits. So that would be my attitude, but there's no such bill pr proposed for that right now. More than you want to know, probably. <laughs> as governor? No. I'm... Uh, you have to remember, I'm, I'm not just eight years as governor, but uh, eight years as lieutenant governor and six years as senator. And, and I, I think you, people need fresh blood. And I've had a good shot at uh, influencing policy in one way or another in different ways. And I feel good about the uh, successes. I don't always have success, but I've had a number of successes, and I feel good about those. And... Now it's time for people with new ideas and better ideas to come and make us even better. All right, thanks everyone. State House program funding provided by the South Dakota Bar Foundation, the educational and charitable arm of South Dakota lawyers and judges. Programming is made possible with your annual membership in the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Additional funding provided by... Today, we're moving the prairie forward. For the farmers and manufacturers, you are our member owners. Together, 
We are re-energizing rural. Every day, Janet is able to repel distributed denial-of-service attacks, rushing her service.